welcome to the Productpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole DeLarzac, product development and marketing coach and mom of three. Learn from and get inspired by women entrepreneurs killing it in the product space. Each episode, we will share the latest trends, proven strategies, and inside secrets of the product world, all designed to give you greater confidence to create your own success through a product venture. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 26 of the Productpreneur podcast. I'm so excited to share today's guest. If you loved episode 23 with inventor Lori Turk, you will also love this one. I had the pleasure of chatting with Alison Brett, founder and inventor of Class Magic. With a career in teaching children and a lifelong love for working with others, Alison has enjoyed helping people and coming up with more efficient ways to complete daily tasks. She realized, out of personal frustration, that clasp bracelet attachment was a problem that not only she had. Clasps are used on bracelets as they are the most secure form of attachment. However, women are struggling to attach bracelets due to long nails, lack of time, being alone, or having minor dexterity issues. So, the concept for clasp magic was born. Allison designed, prototyped, patented, and launched clasp magic in 2019. This device offers the complete solution for clasp bracelet attachment. It holds the clasp in a secure and open position, allowing the user to place their wrist, connect the loop end in, and release. Allison herself is a busy mompreneur with four young children. Finding time each morning to get herself ready is a daily challenge, and she's so thankful that she's now able to attach her bracelets in mere seconds every time. She has received five patents, with the USPTO, the CIPO, and the IPO. She was nominated One to Watch at the 2019 Mompreneur Awards and has been nominated for RBC's Women of Influence Awards in 2020. She loves helping other inventors and women get started on their businesses. She hopes that her journey and story will inspire others, which I'm sure it will. Now, Allison is not only so kind, but she's also super thoughtful and generous. After the interview, she dropped off two Class Magic devices on my porch. I was so surprised and just in awe of this generosity, and I can't tell you how much easier putting on my bracelets has become. Allison is also generously offering free standard shipping for our listeners within Canada and the USA. So just use this code CMSHIPPING, all in caps, to redeem. You can find this code in the show notes. So I am sure you're going to fall in love with her as much as I did. And so let's hear from Allison herself. All right. Welcome, Allison. So excited to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So we met through our mutual networking group. It's sort of a group for women entrepreneurs. And I reached out to you because I've been watching your story for a long time how you became an inventor and you sell this fabulous product, which we'll talk about. And I thought it'd be so interesting to have you on the podcast because I'm sure everyone can learn so much from your journey. But after talking with you, uh, we actually noticed a lot of commonalities. So first of all, we both went to the same school at one point in Oakville, the town of Oakville, Canada. And then we went to the same university at some point, not at the same time, but and then now we live in the same city, Oakville. So (laughs) Pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. <laughs> yeah, lots of lots of common uh, interests there. So yeah, I'd love to hear about your story of how you became an entrepreneur, inventor. Where did you start and, and how did you get there? Sure. Well, actually, my, uh, my history and my background is teaching. And so I actually would never say I saw myself as being an entrepreneur one day, um, even though it actually is in the genes. My grandfather was an entrepreneur as well. Um, I taught overseas and I loved and valued my independence and I love working with children. But then I, I reached this roadblock when I changed my teaching postings from Singapore to Switzerland. And You know, it takes a lot of courage to pick yourself up and move to a foreign country with, you know, you don't speak the language and all these other factors. And I was brand new to Switzerland and I faced this challenge of attaching bracelets 
um, when I wanted to go to my first work event. And, you know, I didn't really like how that felt. You know, I work with young children who are constantly asking me, can you help me do this? Or can you help me with this? And, and there I was, you know, the mature teacher asking, you know, for help having someone attach my bracelet. So at that moment, I had an aha moment, if you will. And, you know, I conceptualized you know what, I know exactly how I'm going to fix this one day. I pictured the device in my head and I said, yeah, I'm going to do that one day. Cause, because if it's frustrating me, it's definitely frustrating women everywhere. Mm. And, and I, I was young at that time. So, you know, if I'm young and struggling with this, there, there must be more women like me. Right, exactly. So then you, you thought about the idea and then how did you come up with the, the idea to launch this wonderful product that, well, can you tell us about the product? Okay. So this is my um, pretty and pink version. So it's called class magic and it is a device for helping attach class bracelets. So you can see this is the main mechanism here and why my product is unique is that it actually holds the clasp in a secure and open position. So that means that you will never have to fiddle with your nails to open a clasp. I have one right here, so I'll show you. This is a very common bracelet. This one happens to be from Tiffany & Co, but you can see you've got your clasp held open for you. So all you actually have to do is you place your wrist, connect the loop end into the open clasp, press the release, and you've attached it yourself. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so for people who are listening who can't see it, <laughs> there is a device and we will post a link to it on the show notes. It takes a few seconds and it works with lobster clasps and ring clasps of various sizes. And, you know, when I set out on this journey, I wanted to address the most complicated issue of bracelet attachment, and that is fiddling with the clasp. And so taking a big challenge on because it hasn't been done before, holding different types and shapes of clasps open, but that was the only way I wanted to approach and create the solution. So yeah, th this product is completely unique. Like I've never heard of anything that helps you put on your bracelet because I know I've struggled with that for sure. And I've, there's been times that I've asked my husband, can you help me put this bracelet on? And it's so frustrating. So uh, I think that's brilliant. So how did you actually develop it? Like, where did you start? So I actually decided to start looking at invention help companies. I remember the day I set out setting, I had made a list of go to companies and I started calling and I found a company that really resonated well and I just got a really good feeling. I went and pitched my idea, I had a free consultation and that went really well. And so then, you know, I was offered a proposal for how to start doing the CAD drawings and we just started making appointments and meetings and we'd go in at least once a month and that was the first phase. And then when that phase is complete and you're happy with the CAD drawings and then you actually start the prototyping stage, which was mm. really the exciting stage of all of this. For sure. But did you know that your product was completely unique? Like, did you have to go through some patent searches or anything? They also helped do that as well. Most companies, I believe, and especially the one I worked with, they weren't interested in going down this path, you know, if they're working on someone else's patents or if there's a, right. a product that's alike. So we did do that research first. And actually there are, I, I would say there's one other product I know of that helps with the loop end. So it will hold the loop end of the bracelet open, but you still have to wrap the bracelet around and with one hand fiddle with the clasp. And to me, anytime you're fiddling with one hand with a clasp, that's still annoying and frustrating. So as my father would quote, because we'd go to the meetings together, he's like, you've got to build a better mousetrap. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, this is the right way to do it. Because when you've got that clasp held secure open and you're not even fiddling with your nails, then all you have to do is the simple part of just placing your wrist. Because right. with any bracelet attachment, you've lost one of your workable hands just placing your wrist to have the bracelet put on. Did you test with uh, people? Like, did you know that this was a problem for other people or you just assumed it? You know, it was really hard in the beginning because I did want to keep it quite hush hush. So I talked to my family, like close family, but I guess I actually kind of just assumed. And when I worked with the people to design it, I knew that they had said, oh yeah, my wife, my girlfriend asks me all the time. It's so frustrating. So I had a little bit to go on, but just knew I had to do this because also I wanted one as well. Oh. <laughs> so, so I knew I wanted to solve it. And, and I guess I um, had a blind faith that there would be other women as well. Right. Well, that's usually how it starts. It's like we see a problem we want to solve for ourselves and we can't find anything like it. So you did well there. And, and then when you 
actually started to look into the design because it's a quite a unique design. What was that process like with the designer and working on the prototype? And did you have a few iterations? And- yes, we definitely had a few iterations and it was, it was frustrating at times. I mean, simple things such as the general size of the product. I had always envisioned almost like a tape dispenser that you put on a desktop. You know, it would be sturdy because you're, you've got to place your wrists and wrists come in various sizes and shapes. I didn't want it to scratch and you, I needed a lid to protect. So those were more the simple outer, um, the exterior features. But then when you got down to the mechanics, the actual way of putting the clasp in a secure position and cranking back the little lever to open the clasp, I had always envisioned it happening a different way. And it took several iterations, actually, because if you look at the two main types of clasp, you've got your circular ring clasp. And the lever for that is, if you're thinking about a clock, it's at the nine or 10 o'clock position. So it opens sideways. But then a lobster clasp, the opening is above the little lever is underneath. So how are you going to develop a device that can, you know, um, work for all of these different types and shapes. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very frustrating. And we first figured out how to do the lobster class, because if you're having um, women, you know, successfully use your product, you want the loop to be able to go directly in a downward position. So just up and over and place it in. So that seemed easy. We got that one working. But we really actually struggled with how can I also load a ring clasp into the same device when it looks nothing the same. And it was a really fun meeting, actually. It was the one and only meeting my husband was able to join us for. And we were sitting around the table and it was like, we just turned the ring clasps on their side. (laughs) And now and now we look at it and it was Oh, how did we not think of that right from the very beginning? But you know, sometimes when you're in it, you need to step back and then you know, maybe a fresh pair of eyes help. So that's right. how we, we decided. And, and from then on, it was, it was done. That, that was the, the last challenge we had to solve. And so that was, that was how it came about. Kind of Very funny. cool. So then, so that's the design. And then at that point, did you get a prototype? Yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah. after that, yes, we did get the, the prototype. Um, And as we had discussed at that time, when you have a prototype that you're able to test, I can still remember it arrived. um, It was just before Christmas time, actually, it was like the best present ever. And to open up something, you know, that you've had in your head for so long to see it in, um, in life and try it, it was just absolutely amazing. So then when you try it, no, it's probably not 100% perfect, but it's close enough. And at that point, you realize, okay, now, I know what, where we need to go to get it market ready. But at that point, we also thought, okay, now it's time to patent because it works. Mm -hmm. And and then that was the, that was the next step from there. Right. So you filed for a patent. And so you filed for a patent after you had the prototype. Is that correct? Um, Actually, no, I, I filed for a provisional patent, which is quite simple to do almost the day after I did my free consultation and we decided that we were going to go ahead with this process. Okay. And it was just, um, I believe it's quite simple. It's not very expensive and it's just almost like a description of what you're trying to do. There's Mm -hmm. no drawings. And so that was uh, filed very, very early on, almost within the first couple of days. So yes, after having my um, prototype and testing it and being happy with where we were at, that's when we decided to take on the process of filing for an American utility patent with the USPTO. And, you know, it's an expensive and lengthy process, but definitely one I recommend. I believe it took just under a year, well, about a year and a half, actually, from filing date to receiving it. And yeah, it was, it's pretty exciting to, to receive your official patent in the, in the mail. And I then at that time decided, actually, Maybe it was a few months after I decided to also file for the Canadian utility patent. And I, and I did receive that one as well. So I have two utility patents. Got it. Okay. So first you did the provisional, which basically just it's like patent reserves patent. your, yeah, reserves your right to, to file that patent eventually. But you have it within a year, I believe, to file for the utility patent. Is that correct? I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm forgetting a bit of the details on that. I do know from the day you file your provisional patent, this is how it was when I was in the process. You have, I think it's 36 months to file for any utility patents you want. I was not really aware of this and happened to actually just get my Canadian utility patent 
filed in in the nick of time (laughs) which i would definitely recommend uh i mean there's so much going on at this time and you know i've got young kids as well so it's easy to miss a step but just be very careful when you file for patents that you know the time frames that are there because you know i had a sand timer flipped on my timing for all of these and i wasn't aware of that so wow i mean you can't there is no worldwide patent that exists so you have to be you know, careful and pick, you can't get, well, maybe you can't afford to get patents everywhere, but just do the ones, the main ones. And to get the North America mostly covered was, was a pretty big achievement. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So you had filed for this patent, but you still kept going with the whole process. So I remember you were saying that you wanted to get your prototype with the manufacturer you weren't happy with the first version. So what happened there? So we decided to build a second mechanical prototype right from the original and it was pretty close. So at that point we tested it for 24 hours and we're quite happy with where it was at. And then we decided to send it over to Asia to get essentially three quotes from different manufacturers. And unfortunately this uh, mechanical prototype did go missing. It's a long story, that one. But what happened, what ended up happening was we had to rebuild it. But while we were rebuilding it, one manufacturer, uh, you know, I agreed they were going to do a small production run. And so I decided to try and go ahead with this manufacturer. And they sent their first rendition over to me. And they were only working from CAD drawings at this point because the, the new prototype was being rebuilt. So they didn't have it in-house to compare and work from. So they were just using the drawing. So the, their first rendition was sent to me and it was pretty shocking. I, to be honest, it was about a four out of 10. And I remember uh, looking at my husband and saying, you know, oh my gosh, this is really worrying. You know, we've got a time frame to get, you know, market ready products and this is not close enough to the mark. So actually, that's when we decided, you know, Allison, you're going to fly over there and you're going to meet the manufacturer and you're going to get this right. Right. And and so I did. And, um, you know, it ended up being one of those hiccups that turns out into the best thing it was meant to be with 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 the type of product I have, especially to go over there and to meet the people responsible for delivering the product in person and discussing all the little changes and you you want done in person i mean you can't compare that it was it, it it was pivotal for my 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 product launch and actually the relationship i developed with the factory manager to this day is amazing i mean we're on whatsapp you know he'll wish me happy birthday and i'll say oh. happy happy chinese new year and you know we're <laughs> we're good friends and you know you need to have these personable relationships during this journey because, you know, it makes people work a little bit harder for you and then you trust them a little more, you know, so I broke down going over there really broke down any barriers and, you know, they put a face to my name and they knew I was serious about my product and getting it right. So it was a really big deal and a really, a bad event that turned into something phenomenal. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's nothing that can replace in-person contact. Unfortunately, yeah. right now, that's not a reality for everyone. No. But to meet with them face to face, to actually go physically there and explain yeah. everything and they can see your passion, they can see your vision. So that's amazing. But you left your family. Didn't yes. you have new newborns? Or <laughs> uh, You know, it was actually a really funny, it was the first time and you'll say, oh no, you went away for a weekend. It was legitimately the first time I ever left my children. And I laugh because my parents are quite helpful, but they happened to be going to the States to visit my brother for American Thanksgiving. So there was Nick on his own with all four kids. <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it was a really hard, I mean, I think once I got on the airplane, I was okay, but you know, here I am, I've applied for my Chinese business visa within days and I'm flying all the way over to Hong Kong and then going into China on my own. Uh, I definitely, you know, was very proud of how, you know, independent and confident I was to pull that off. But Good for yeah, you. I was definitely thankful for the support I had back at home because leaving four young children, I mean, it's not possible if you don't have the help. So yeah, that's certainly tough. And let's go back to, you mentioned the story of losing the prototype on the way. And I know there's a lesson in that. So I just wanted you to share that with everyone. 
I mean, we, it's all resolved at this point, but long story short, when you send something and I wasn't the person actually responsible for sending it, but that doesn't really matter now. What I would say is it's very important to go that extra step and make sure that everything's insured. Um, when you're sending something so valuable, I mean, obviously it's valuable for monetary reasons, but you know, it's just your blood, sweat and tears are in this package. So it's very important to make sure you're sending it, you know, the best way possible. And I honestly would never use the company I used at that time. I make sure everything is insured and you know we'll get there you know it's of utmost importance that it does mm -hmm. and actually i do believe sharing my story with another um, inventor you know and she was sending renditions back and forth she she always remembers my story and she makes sure everything is properly insured and it can be tracked and it, you know it, it saves a lot of stress and mm -hmm. delay time delays and upsets and yes Right. It seems like such an obvious thing, but maybe at the time it was just an honest mistake. But then again, you know, you've spent thousands of dollars on this prototype. Well, so. and, and, you know, companies will have basic insurance. You sometimes have to ask the questions of, I need to pay for additional coverage. And that's what needed to happen. So right. it was technically insured for a small amount, but that, no, it didn't cover the full cost of my, and so I never got okay. back the cost. It wasn't proper. You have to pay, pay for extra and it's really not that much. And when you think of the cost of everything, I mean, it's a cost mm -hmm. you just take on. So, you, but you're, I think the company you worked with actually covered the next prototype. We, we were, we worked that out and yeah, yeah. there's no, and, and like I said, I knew that I was going to go visit my manufacturer at some point. Had this not all gone down, I don't think I would have done it before the first production run, just because it was really hard for me to leave my young family. I didn't right. have my youngest even in school. So now that I look back, it's hard to say, but I, I really do believe it was meant to happen because it made me go over there when I did. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. It's just some things happen for a reason and it yes. was a hiccup, but you solved it and things turned out for the better. So that's right. Perfect. And did you search for manufacturers locally in Canada or? I actually really, you know, as I'm, as I'm doing this or as I'm working on this project, I, you know, I'm raising young children. So I really look to the company I work and designed with to, you know, get their guidance on manufacturers. It just felt very overwhelming for me to also just blindly take that on. And I do know because of the assembly work involved, I have lots of pieces that have to be snapped together, some glued together, mm -hmm. that I just knew at this time, maybe it'll change in the future that I couldn't get my costs down. So I would have to be manufacturing overseas or I could never bring this product to life. I, I did really look and, and use their guidance on where I was going to manufacture. And to be honest, there was only one company that wanted to do a small production run. This process gets quite costly. And I actually had to purchase the injection molding tooling to create Glass Magic. So when you pay all for all that tooling and then you pay for all the new product, I mean, the numbers, and then you've got patents. I mean, it's just the numbers keep creeping up and, you know, we've got a, a large family as well. And I'm working on this project. I'm raising children, but I'm not, you know, a working parent per se. And so it, it's a lot to take on. So I had to be very um, careful with where I was going to manufacture it at this point. And so that's how I ended up choosing. And because of, as I mentioned, because when I went over there, I met everyone in person. It's been a really great relationship, actually. So I'm really that's great. grateful for who I found in the end. Yeah, great. No, it's key to find the right manufacturer. Could you explain what your minimum order quantity is just so people understand like when they're actually producing? So mine, mine was 2000 units. Okay. Okay. So that is an investment for sure. It is. And you know, you also have to remember I'm Canadian and I'm paying everything in American dollars and our exchange rate is not great. Right. So, you know, you, you look at costs and you're like, oh, that would be nice, but then you're paying it in American dollars. So I mean, the cost just creep, 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 creep. And so it was just, you know, do the first production run and keep it as small as you can for now. And, you know, I own the tooling. I was quite proud of myself in the process of, you know, signing the contract with the manufacturer. You know, it started with a couple lines when it was first sent over and I kept adding, adding, adding right down to being, making sure that it was written in that I own the tooling. And if ever I had a disagreement with the manufacturer that I would go over there and get my tooling because I owned it. 
So oh, there's perfect. A lot of, lot of things to figure out, but the, the tooling is quite expensive as well. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. The tooling and sometimes you need injection molds and things like that. That's right. When you ordered the 2000 units and that's just of one SKU or of all the SKUs is 2000? Uh, one SKU. One SKU. So yeah. you have, I think you have two different Right. Three. Three. Three okay. So, yeah. Yeah. so you had to order 6,000. No, no, no. Sorry. I, I, no, I actually did. I can't even remember exactly my breakdown, but I did um, more of the blush pink and then the black was the second and most and the third most was the mauve color. I don't know why I picked those. I just, I asked a few friends which colors they like <laughs> the best. And I just, I kind of blindly went for that one. So, but actually nice. I have been, I've been quite, I was um, quite accurate in actually what I think most people like. The pink is the most popular okay. and, then, and then the black and then the mauve. And actually there's another, there's another element to that. You also have to pay to have your injection molding machine cleaned when you're not at 2000 units per color. So, you know, the cost yeah. just kept adding, adding up. And I just, I couldn't swing a larger purchase order in my first round because I also had to have some flown over to meet a time frame. So then that cost more and the other ones went on, you know, by ocean freight. Mm. So yeah, right. there was those costs as well. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. So 2000 total of like the different that's colors. Right. So then yeah. you, you basically, do you store them in your house or where do you put yes, them? Yes, I do. <laughs> some are in my house. Some are, my parents have decided to help take some as well. We were actually going to use a fulfillment center mm -hmm. in the beginning, but you know, when you're just starting out and I only had six months of selling before this pandemic hit, you know, I dropped my youngest off at school and that was last September. So I had, you know, six months and then, you know, the world started to shut down. So to cut the cost on distri distribution, I decided to do it myself. And I'm very glad that I did. Actually, in the beginning, I would say, I mean, you hear about it all the time of companies starting packing orders on their kitchen tables in their garage and I have a little, I have a really great space in my basement with a table and, you know, the white gloves and everything. And I actually love fulfilling my own orders. It's, oh, wow. <laughs> it's a little surprise that I never thought I would love so much, but it, it's like, I do this happy, it's just fun. It's really great. Yeah. I think it's probably satisfying. You get this order and you're shipping a gift to somebody. So that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Well, most people start off that way. And I think that gives you an idea of the whole process and you like really appreciate all the little pieces that go into sending the product out and then you could be in charge of the experience when somebody opens that box what are they going to find that's right because and also i mean you've had this long journey to bring it to life and then it's like now what now you've got to sell it so now you're on a whole brand new journey of marketing and getting a website up and you know it's all these things that you maybe didn't go to school for and so right. it's you know just it's taking one step forward and maybe sometimes a little step back, but you're constantly learning. And now, you know, once you've got the product, the physical product to sell, that's almost the official beginning, if you will. <laughs> exactly. Now you've got to sell it. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And you also raised funds through a Kickstarter campaign. That's so I'd right. love to hear about that, what it was like, and would you recommend it? I, I'm 50-50 on this one. If I would go through this entire process again, would I do it? Now, here are my positives. The positives about running the Kickstarter was that even though I kept it small, it was successful in the end, and it kept me to a time frame. I, I mean, I think that maybe they have exceptions, but I was under the, under, um, the understanding that I had a, a year to deliver the product to anyone who pledged to buy one. So, and you can imagine, as I, we just shared this, this lost prototype lost me time. So I really appreciated having this time frame of you've got to get this product to your customers by this date. So that really helped push through any um, little hurdles that happened that year, you know, whether it be, I, you know, I had to work on my box design and um, send a couple more uh, samples back and forth to Asia to get them quite right. It really helped me stick to that important time frame of getting the product actually here. Sometimes I think, you know, I think with all the challenges of that year and raising the young, uh, I had one, you know, one of my children was not in school at that time. She was only in preschool a little bit. I would have lost 
my time frame. So that was really, really important. Also, I was able to raise enough money and awareness to help offset my tooling costs. You know, that's, that's what um, Kickstarter was designed for to help, you know, launch products and offset the really big startup costs of this. The challenge is that a lot of Kickstarter campaigns have big teams behind them. They have good media contacts already, and they're almost market ready, if you know what I mean. They, they have their products all lined up, maybe even in a warehouse, ready to distribute to anyone who pre-orders one. And so they're not really using the funds. It's more of an awareness. Mm. So to play in that you know, game, I thought my Kickstarter would do actually a little bit more than it did. But I didn't have, you know, 10, 20 samples to be able to give to um, jewelry influencers because that was essentially a production run, which was what I was doing the whole Kickstarter to offset. So, you know, you have to just be careful that, I mean, uh, like I said, a lot of these really successful campaigns have a lot of media contact. So it's a hard one that I did not have that. And... Yeah, I I still think, I still feel like I would do it again, but I would probably do it myself. I wouldn't hire a company to do it per se and try, try if I could figure out a way to get more samples out to bloggers and whatnot, if you, if you can before, because they really help bring the awareness back to your Kickstarter campaign. But something also that I didn't mention your, your Kickstarter will be on the internet for life. So it was brought to my attention that it's not necessarily a great thing for the success of your product long term if you don't have a successful campaign. Oh. So, you know, and it's, it's quite stressful. I mean, here I have this product that I don't have samples being tested by, you know, lots of women. So it, it can be hard to get people to buy into that and help you get this campaign to its success. Right. Uh, status, you know. So I don't know. I'm 50-50 on would I do it again. Like I said, I think the most for me having the time frame that I had to no matter what I had to deliver the product by like it, it got so close to the wire just because of the lost prototype and actually hitting Chinese New Year. I wasn't really aware that I would lose about 5 to 6 weeks of zero work being done. Mm-hmm. We you know we had our holiday Christmas, so things shut down here. And then I had a couple weeks and then it hit Chinese New Year, which was not a one or two week. It was about five to six weeks where nothing was happening over there. And then, you know, as they're starting to get back, they have lots of other projects they're working on as well. So I actually delivered my products. I did a lot of them in person to my um, backers days before my children got let out from school in June of that year. So I felt, it felt so great, but it was, you know, we had these, these units flown over to save the time. We didn't put them on the ocean freight. And there I am like within days of my children being off on summer vacation, all four of them, I'm running around meeting, meeting all these, uh, the ones I could deliver in person I did. And I got them all delivered right before my children on time. I hit that deadline on time and before my children were, you know, in my care for the next two and a half months. <laughs> oh, wow. Sounds yeah. like in the nick of time, but you still got funded. So that's amazing. Yeah. And so what would you attribute the success of your campaign? Like, what would you say that really helped make the campaigns work? Family and friends support. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Initially, like I said, if I, I, um, when I worked with a company and they wanted to help get it out to bloggers, like I said, I didn't have, I had that one prototype that was, you know, being used to create my entire production line. So I didn't, mm. I didn't have that to work with. So I did definitely had backers who I've never met, but I, it was a lot of family and friends, mm. which is actually often the case. Um, I follow Sarah Blakely quite um, often um, yeah. from Spanx. And if you listen to her story and her journey, her first order I think her first in-store order she she went as far as to send she she paid with her friends to go buy her products right (laughs) out of her store and they're like wow this is flying off the shelf and she actually sent them money to go buy so you know it's often um it's often the way to get you know support from family and friends and it was actually nice because for a lot of this journey you know you're quite secretive until you have your uh, patent secure you don't talk to a lot of people 
And so it was nice for, for everyone to be like, oh my goodness, you've been working on this. That's great. I think my friend might like one or, you know, my cousin. Yeah. And then it kind of, it just spreads like that. So That's so nice. Yeah. Thanks to those family and friends. Yes. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and did you do any, I know, cause there's sometimes there's a lot of advertising behind the Kickstarter campaigns. Did you have to like pay for certain ads or create videos? I did do a videos. little bit of that. Yes. Yes. We did create videos and yes, we did a little bit of that and email campaigns before launching. I had help with all of that. Okay. And yeah, so there's a lot of things that go into that and bringing the awareness and mm -hmm. yes. Right. Okay, good. I think the Kickstarter campaign is a great lesson for people that I know a lot of people consider it but it is a great way to get pre-orders for and to fund your production run. So That's I think right. in that sense, it's it's really helpful. So I think if somebody's thinking of doing a Kickstarter campaign, not to dismiss it, but just to keep in mind that, yeah. Actually, if a lot of companies will take you to the next level, if you if you meet your funding goal, they will help take it and kind of blow it up. Now, here's the thing that you also have to remember. If you are lucky to be one of those big campaigns that do blow up, that's when copycat or, you know, will can possibly enter as well. And so that's a whole nother, I remember watching, there was a really successful uh, Kickstarter. Was it right before mine? It was called the final straw and it was a company that designed, you know, a portable it's a Ben it's maybe it's Silicon. I think they have different versions now, uh, but it was to replace you know, one use one time plastic straws because you know, they're filling the oceans and whatnot. But as this is running, I mean, you can see all the other companies that are seeing how well they're doing and trying to get around and, mm. and that's, that can be quite stressful, you know, For and sure. if you're, if you're a company that's, you know, planning to use the funding to get your product, to bring it to life, you might need a bit more time than another company that could start getting it to customers faster than you. So there's a lot that goes into a Kickstarter and, you know, I personally have an idea for a second version, a little bit different. And I've thought about it. I'm like, would I, would I do a Kickstarter again to launch a second version? And it's not going to be the same. It would do a different feature or I'd have a different function. And I, I seriously am considering if I got to that point to do it again, because it is a great marketing tool. Mm -hmm. I would know exactly what I needed. And I would know that I would have to be very quick to deliver products. And, you know, I know these things now, but it is a great marketing tool and collecting pre-orders. It, it's great. It's really Exactly. Good. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you, at least you've got some secured demand. That's for right. sure. And tell us about the name class magic. I know there's a story to that. <laughs> so there is a fun story to this. Actually, when I first pitched my idea way back in, you know, August 2014, it was called a bracelet's best friend. <laughs> and, and, and I remember it was a it was a really lovely woman and she, you know, she's an entrepreneur herself as well. And she kind of said at one point, I you need to rebrand this. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. And you know, this is months before I did do my Kickstarter, so I'm okay. So I just started brainstorming and you know for me it just magic just kept coming up and you know for me it does feel like magic because when you go from struggling to being able to to attach a bracelet I, I mean I obviously I'm the inventor but I can attach any bracelet with a clasp you give to me in under three seconds so it, it is like magic mm. but um Actually, yeah, it was really fun. I, I decided to work with a company to redesign my logo and whatnot. And having a bunch of different designers, you know, come up with a design was really a great way because I, you know, I had the word class magic, but as I told you before, I, it was, it was originally a bracelet's best friend. So I had a whole different logo already designed, so I couldn't get past what I wanted it to look like. So I pitched, it was actually, I think it was called, the company I used was Design Crowd, and you can decide how many renditions you want, and they're freelance um, graphic designers, and they just want some extra money. You own your, you own the design in the end, and you can have 20-odd designers create a logo for you, and it's a really great way because you'll, you've got 20 fresh minds looking at and, and, and coming up with something really unique. So once I had the word class magic, like I love the idea of how the first C was the lobster class and the last C was the ring class. And then, you know, I've got the little star for the magic above the eye, but then it went a little bit farther. I wanted to have a little logo on the top of my lid. 
And so I took the lobster class and I chose, you know, the four little stars and they're actually um, one for each of my children. So I went back to the same designer who had done my class magic and said, can we just do a mini logo? Because I, you know, my word is class magic, but I just want to have this small little design that would look really nice on the lid. Um, and I had to put my children in this journey because oh, yeah, it's beautiful. They've been, such a, they've been such a big part of it. And yeah, a lot, a lot to do with my why I brought this to life as well. So yeah. Can you, can you speak about your why actually? Okay, so I had, I, you know, I had this idea for 10 years before I acted on it, and I wanted to show my children, you know, if you have something you're passionate about, it's going to take hard work, but you can get there in the end if you're willing to keep going. But also, I just didn't want to wake up one day and not have tried this thing, this idea I had, you know, uh, or even worse, wake up one day and see someone that had done it and you know, it just it didn't seem right. And I was a teacher, actually, young teacher at kindergarten for many years. And I actually did lose a student in my first class. She did pass from leukemia. And that experience will stay with me forever. And what it taught me was, you know, days before she passed, she shared her dreams for what she wanted to be when she grew up. And watching a young child never fulfill their their life wishes you know makes you think you know what i will never live with regret i just mm -hmm. won't you know i'm lucky enough to be here today you know i have so many blessings and i just don't want to live with regret this is something i really want to try and i wanted to go for it mm, that's so beautiful tears <laughs> to my eyes <laughs> you know, oh, it's, but it's yeah, so true yeah it is so true and it's yeah. a good lesson for all of us yes yeah, for it sure. is and mm -hmm. I definitely would recommend if, you know, there's different things you can invent. I, I say mine's a completely unique product, but some, some women um, are what I would call their product hackers. They take a product that is already on the market, but they make it that much better. Right. But whether, whatever path you're taking, you know, you won't regret trying absolutely. at all. So, right, and I right. would absolutely go down this path again. <laughs> I mean, there's blood, sweat, and tears, but you know, you, you become your best cheerleader. You know that you're, you know, every day, if you can accomplish one thing, put your foot one step ahead, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get there and you've, you've got to be proud of yourself, right? Mm, absolutely. So. If you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Two things, actually. I, I, I would like to have had some kind of small maybe part-time job I had it was it's hard because I had all these young children as well and anything you take on distracts from what you're trying to accomplish as well exactly but you almost need a small little money tree growing in your backyard so I might if there was something part-time I could have figured out it would have just eased the burden um, on my family financially with that but the second thing would be I, I would have looked out for a mentor and I think this is really important and this is why I will always reach out. In fact, I've spoken to many aspiring entrepreneurs and I've personally spoken to them if they've asked for help. I think it's very important to turn around and help the person that's coming up behind you. I felt very alone doing this journey and did not have a mentor. Um, the company that I worked with now uses me almost as their go-to to woman to call and speak to and I'm willing to help um, as much as I can. Hmm. But to have someone, you know, kind of just share your worries and your fears and maybe get some guidance. I mean, that's, that's what I would have liked to have had if I mm -hmm. could have changed it. Just a yeah. little bit of comfort because, you know, asking your family to always be that and to always be your own cheerleader gets hard in those moments, those hard moments. So to have had a yeah. mentor to be, you know, I'm stuck here. What would you suggest to have someone to, you know, roll off, roll a little off with? would have been great. Right. It can be lonely for sure. Being an entrepreneur yeah. is a lonely journey. So that's why coaches and mentors are so important yeah. and having surrounding yourself with people who are doing similar things as well. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is next for class magic? What, what kind of future do you see? So I'm hoping to keep going with sales now that, you know, my children are finally back in school and not, not attached to me 24 um, seven. Just keep going with the sales and hopefully I, I get to the point where I can release the next two products I have in the back of my head. Um, and I'm hoping to solve 
jewelry attachment for women for the rest <laughs> for the end you know to the end of time everything yeah. all of it so yeah just continuing to get that awareness out there uh between you and me and anyone who's listening i have um i have a dream and a goal to take take it to dragon's den this march so hopefully we'll see if i can <laughs> nice <laughs> i'm brave enough to do it but why not why not exactly you know, no, this is a year where you're a small business owner and, you know, the world is, this is the biggest hardship in, in the economy since what, the Great Depression. So, you know, I, you know, it's very unnerving as you're a small business watching huge companies go down all around you and you're like, I'm still standing. But, you know, I, I just think, why not? I'm going to go for it. And, you know, I'm a female inventor. You know, they say the, the future is female. But, you know, with all that's happened, it's really been a bit of a femme recession. And mm. uh, I think, why not? I'm going to just go for it. For sure. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And what's the one thing you'd love to help have help with if there's anyone listening that can? can you- I would love to have help with marketing, to be honest. Yeah, I'm. I'm learning how to, I mean, it's a whole nother world. Facebook ads, Google ads, driving the right traffic, finding your target market. I mean, I, I started the year trying all different things to see where my best selling point would be. And, you know, I did the trade shows. Well, trade shows are done for a very long time right now. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's going to be online marketing. And so that's, right. that's definitely right. where I'm needing the help at this point. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. All right. Can you tell everyone how people can find your products? And yeah, and you- so I'm, I am, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, but my, and my website is simply www.classmagic.com. And yes, you can purchase it online. It's a Shopify store and everything's secure and the shipping rates are great. And it does make a great gift. So many times, you know, I, I look at my bracelet collection, you've got all these beautiful bracelets. Half the time they sit in drawers and jewelry, yeah, exactly. jewelry boxes unworn. So you know, this brings life back to jewelry that women already have. So it, it does make a great gift. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your story, for being on the show and, and for all of your honesty about the process. It's awesome. Thanks for having me. I really do hope that this podcast helps inspire someone or another helping another woman would be a great, a great accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for listening to the Productpreneur Podcast. If you loved this episode, we'd be so grateful if you could take a sec to subscribe, share it, and review it on Apple Podcasts. Your review will help more women build their own dream product business. By the way, if you have any feedback, comments, or questions, email me at info at Until next time, keep dreaming up those product ideas.